rich. But not every 20-something in hospital is a casualty. Excuse me, I'm one of the doctors. I need to ask you some questions. Ready to take care of these patients are an army of people the same age who have spent their 20s studying to become doctors. Their medical training has cost £150,000 each. They are newly qualified and about to face the harsh realities of life on an NHS ward. You can pass an exam. That doesn't mean you've proved that you could be a good doctor. I'm sorry. It is sort of life and death. He was looking at my badge as if to say, who are you? You know, what do you know? Welcome to the world of junior doctors. I guess if I really messed up, I probably could kill someone. Basically, days like today just make me want to quit medicine. Seven newly qualified doctors are sharing this house in Newcastle. Second years, Kia, Andy, John and Susie have been working on the wards for 12 months. I'm only human, so is every other doctor in the world, you know? We can't work magic. <laughs> First years, Lucy, Catherine and Adam have been qualified doctors for just two weeks. I just feel like I'm still out of my depth and that it's more scary than exciting. They have all spent at least five years at medical school, learning to treat patients and save lives. Until you actually come and do the job, you don't really realise that you are going to have this level of responsibility. Like, you do know your respons responsibility is going to be changed. There really is just so much to learn. I feel like I just hardly know any of it. Now, as first-time doctors, they're finding out if they've really got what it takes. So, could you give me a hand? Sorry, this needle's just about to drop out. I'm going to try not to rest. To the left or right. Which way? And they're learning the toughest lesson of all. This poor lady that I've seen today has been told some of the worst news, well, the worst news that she's ever going to hear. Ever. Her life has literally been taken away from her like that. That they can't cure everyone. morning in Newcastle. At the house that our seven newly qualified junior doctors are sharing, they're getting ready for their next shifts at the city's hospitals. 24-year-old John is heading to a new assignment on a new ward. I've only been doing this stuff for, for 12 months, so I'm not proclaiming to be you know, the best in the world. As long as I do what's expected of me, do the basics, and, you know, and don't make any massive cock-ups. I think that's kind of what, really, that's all that can be expected. John is based at the Royal Victoria Infirmary's Emergency Assessment Unit, where he's part of the hospital's crash call team. And it's not long before the crash alarm on his phone goes off. It means that someone somewhere in the hospital needs urgent attention. Cardiac arrest! John must drop what he's doing, find the patient, and try and save them. It's a life or death situation. The patient has gone into cardiac arrest. Her heart is failing. Less than 10% are successfully resuscitated. John is one of the first on the scene. The patient has no pulse. John starts chest compressions to keep blood flowing around the body. 29, 30. Go femoral. You're never going to get a pulse, are you? Because she's not got output, so femoral stuff. But with no heartbeat, time is running out. She's had two days of full maximum treatment. She's still arrested despite that. She's not in a shock of the rhythm. We're not getting anything. Does everybody agree that we should stop? Yeah. The team have done everything they can. Thanks, guys. The death of a patient is something John and his housemates will all have to learn how to deal with. I can find a bit. That's it, really. Um, so, it was unsuccessful. Most cardiac arrests you go to are unsuccessful. If they're not monitored, if they're not on an actual screen, then people don't see them actually have a heart attack. There's, a, there's only about a 10% chance that you get them back. And this lady was pretty ill. Um, in the first place and then had a cardiac arrest on top of it, so yeah, that was it really. It was um, nothing we could do unfortunately, so that's that, back to the ward. All junior medics must come to terms with the fact that they can't save every patient. Junior doctors really are dealing with other people's lives and, and, and 
that's that's a huge, huge burden of responsibility, and, and people feel that, and they feel that quite acutely. Um, and it's a level of responsibility that uh, most people never have to deal with at any point in their lives, even when they're quite mature and could perhaps handle it. Junior doctors are 20, 23, 24, and that's, that's a big deal at that age. Whether on a crash team or on a ward, junior doctors have to face life and death situations every day. First year Lucy is starting her medical career on the specialist gastroenterology ward. Oh, that's a bit strange. Our names are on the wall. Yeah. I know, that's scary, isn't it? Uh oh. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> the gastro ward deals with all parts of the digestive system, from top to bottom. They treat patients with life threatening bowel and liver disease. So Lucy's first experience of working as a doctor will be learning to treat some of the most seriously ill patients in the hospital. When I saw gastro was on here, it was one of the ones I'd like wanted to get some experience of. It's a hard ward to work on. A lot of the, the alcoholic patients are hard to deal with because of their behaviour. It's either somewhere where you love or, or you, you hate. There's no sort of in between. So I guess with gastro, if you don't, if, if you're a bit funny on bowels, like bowels and stool samples <laughs> and things, it, yeah, it's not the place to work. <laughs> With six million young people in the UK regularly binge drinking, the gastro ward is seeing many younger alcoholics. So 24-year-old Lucy is treating some patients her own age. Uh, there's a new lady in bed 12, Laura. She's an IV drug abuser and she is an alcohol abuser as well. Mm. She's on the detoxing regime. 26-year-old Laura was admitted to A&E with drink and drug problems. She's been referred to the gastro ward to further assess her condition. Is the pain there all the time, or is it, does it come and go? Comes and goes. Living situations, you live by yourself? Yeah, um, I live in a hostel. Live in a hostel, OK. Do you mind me asking, do you smoke? Yeah. How long have you smoked for? Um, since I was 11. And do you smoke anything other than cigarettes at all? No, no just... Uh, just cigarettes, OK. Um, and alcohol-wise, I understand that you do drink, yeah. and you're on a detox programme in here, is that right? Yeah. What is it that you drink? How much do you reckon you have on an average day? It used to be like two, two litre bottles mm -hmm. to myself. Is that every day? Um, just when I got really bored, I could tell I was really bad because I, um, I couldn't really drink. drink. I was pouring it down the sink. And so the fact that you're not able to drink is telling you that you are very poorly and you're not feeling yourself OK? I did think I was going to die or something, because when I was bleeding as well, the big clot. Is that right, you? You're in the right place now to get that sorted, definitely. OK. We are a similar age, and that is a strange feeling to think that we're in very different situations. And I mean, I, I hope that in talking to me or whoever manages her in the end, um, it helps her to feel like she's being listened to and not being judged. And I mean, I certainly am not, wouldn't judge her for any of the decisions she's made about that because, you know, I don't know what's happened in the past. I don't know what's started off with all of that kind of thing. And it's not for me to say. The most important thing to me is that if we can, we can get her off it and keep her off it. Just have a chat with Laura and I will go and look up those bloods, um, find her notes um, and perhaps speak to VJ um, about what to do next in terms of whether she needs to have that, that fluid taken off and sent off. Um, but yeah, so I'll go and document all that. Yeah. Lovely, thanks. No problem. While Lucy is learning to deal with patients with long-term problems, 24-year-old John is working at the sharp end of medicine on the emergency assessment unit. When he's not responding to crash calls, he has to deal with emergency cases sent in from other wards and from local GPs. It's one of the most demanding wards in the hospital. Oh, hi there. My name is Dr. Barclay. I'm one of the doctors over at um, the emergency admissions unit at the RVI. We are the receiving ward from all from GPs and all from accident and emergency, so it all comes and it just gets funneled. And then, and then some of these patients like, need to move on to other wards, but there's a backlog in beds there. So it's basically we have to accept everyone, and yet there's nowhere to send anyone to. That's why it's the busiest ward in the hospital. The ward assesses up to 50 patients per shift. John must learn to separate the mundane from the life-threatening. A bit of everything, really. Just to try and plough through the patients as much as possible. He's the ward's first line of defence. What I'm looking for, really, in a good junior doctor is the ability to manage patients, not just to make the diagnosis. I think what we look for, we look for the transition from being a medical student to becoming a doctor. John's next patient has lost the feeling down one side of his body. Keep it in the air, don't let me push it down. Good. This one. Keep it in the air, don't let me push it down. 
John checks for nerve damage. It could be a sign of a stroke. Ah, I've got it. Turn off. It's <laughs> Sorry. When you run your pen down the bottom of someone's foot, it makes the toes curl downwards. But sometimes if you have problems with the connections in your brain, it can make your toes go upwards instead. He's passed the pen test. Next, John takes some blood for further investigation. Have you done this before? Just a few hundred times. Scratch. Oh, done. Is that it? That's it for needles. Don't forget me check. The key to John's role is prioritising the most serious patients. So I have a dilemma. These people came in 20 minutes beforehand, but this gentleman's slightly sicker. Swings and roundabouts, really. Let's see the sick guy, shall we? John's whole life is one big balancing act. I think it's fair to say that doctors have a reputation of kind of work hard, play hard. I do lots of stuff in my spare time, so I play drums in a band. We have a job which is a time intensive, so we don't get a lot of time off. And B also you can be quite stressful, you know, under pressure quite a lot of the time. Um, and so when you do get a chance to sort of let your hair down, you know, a bit of a release, then you want to make the most of that, really. Rugby kind of has a bit of a niche for people of my size and with my abilities. <laughs> It's definitely a big part of the club, but far enough to feel. Yeah, size-wise mainly. <laughs> John Barkley's acceleration is one of the finest you're going to see for a guy what is essentially a whale. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> it can be hard to fit in with my schedule sometimes. Like today, I mean, I finished night shift this morning, so I've been awake for 26 hours. Yeah. I think it's important to have a life outside medicine, definitely. If you just do medicine, then I personally would just get massively depressed and I'd get into a massive rut and it just wouldn't be enjoyable anymore. The time constraints of the job make it hard, but my job's my job, but this is kind of hard. Fun. John Barkley, you suffer from morbid obesity and you're gonna die young, John Barkley. Back at the hospital, the emergency assessment unit is getting busier. Hey mate, are you still doing jobs from the morning? Have you been able to see anyone yet? John thrives on having lots to do, but he needs to prove he can stay on top of the workload. It's just frustrating. It's pretty busy today. We've got like all the beds are taken. We've still got people waiting in the waiting room. I've, I've got I've got people that I need to see, but there aren't any rooms free to see people in. I don't know why it's such a busy day, but it's just a terrible day. And his day isn't getting any easier. Another emergency case has arrived. A man has been admitted suffering a severe seizure. John has to try and diagnose the cause. You just had another flip. Bit your tongue, which is why your mouth tastes a bit funny. I need to have a look at your mouth, Frank, so I need to see where you bit your tongue. He's been admitted to us because... Yeah, that alcohol withdrawal seizure, so it means that when people drink excessively, when they stop drinking, sort of teetotal, they go into withdrawal, basically like you would from any other drug. So we need to give him enough medication to sort of calm him down a bit, and we can do some investigations to try and get to the bottom of what's wrong with him. John has stabilised him, but there's no let-up. I was supposed to see this lady about half an hour ago, but the room's been occupied, so I just need to... Like, and there's nothing else I could be doing in this downtime, so I'm literally just waiting. A patient has been referred from A&E. She's suffering from a severe asthma attack. It's the essence of had such a fast Okay. And do you feel like you're struggling to catch your breath or...? It, it, it just seems as if there's like a blockage, you know? So it feels... We say it just feels a bit tight. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. It was like a brick on it. And if it's just... And then, oh, yeah. Okay. And it doesn't even need stop. <laughs> just clean itself. <laughs> Do you want to pop up onto the couch for me and I'll have a quick examine of you? Just listen to your heart and your lungs. Um, and then we'll get you sorted. Some nice deep breaths in and out through your mouth. <coughs> She's got a history of lung disease, so John prescribes medication she can inhale to get to the root of the problem. We'll, uh, we'll give you some nebulizers. Keep going with that and just try and get on top of that, OK? Another cup of tea, actually. Another cup of medicine. I'll pass it along. Another patient dealt with, but there's always another to see on the EAU. 
His next job looks like an extreme case of athlete's foot. What's been going on with you then? I was a fireman by profession, and I got involved in a lot of different chemical Fine. jobs, type of things like that. One would put down a metallic poison. Right, sir. Is it painful? No. John prescribes a course of antibiotics. His ability under pressure hasn't gone unnoticed. His knowledge base is, is good, is sound. He's going to make a very, very safe doctor. I would be happy to be looked after him at any time. And for a nurse to say that, that's quite good. As a second year, John's responsibilities are growing. But on the gastro ward, Lucy's discovering that first years often have to start at the bottom. I wonder whether or not she's passed some stools and that they want me to have a quick look at it. <laughs> Right, so if I just have a quick... Um, is not there any blood or anything in it? They're just no, a, it's not good. It's, it's just greeny. Because obviously I've not experienced these things yet. Mm, sweet smell. It's a green, very, very watery, isn't it? A green and watery stool is a sign of a serious infection. It could even be the deadly C. difficile bacteria. But even stool samples can't dent Lucy's passion for medicine. From a young age, she's always known she wanted to be a doctor for a very particular reason. <laughs> got a little sister, Sophie. She was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. That obviously encompasses an awful lot of care and treatment. And from her coming home, really, um, from hospital during that time, I sort of got involved with her care. It really made me want to go further with that kind of thing. Um, and obviously, medicine is the perfect way to do that. On paper, the life expectancy and the prognosis isn't great. And um, obviously, that's hard for me and my family when you sit down and actually think about that, having someone who's so close to you with that kind of condition. Good to have helpers. <laughs> Very handy indeed. Makes it a much nice process. <laughs> Bananas, nuts, and I'll add chocolate chips in a minute. When you need to get stressed, you need to get baking. And it might be tired so in a minute, but just test it. She is the older sister and always wants to look after the younger ones, always feeling that maybe that's her role, but she's always, she enjoys it so much. Um, probably the perfect older sister you could ask for, really. Lucy's sister is well at the moment, but cystic fibrosis is a life-threatening condition. There are more than 8,500 sufferers in the UK, and they're often in and out of hospital. At the Royal Victoria, cystic fibrosis patients are treated on the hospital's respiratory ward, where Lucy's housemate and fellow junior Adam has his first job as a doctor. Cystic fibrosis affects the lungs and the pancreas. You get lots and lots of lung infections. Your lungs eventually, you know, fibrose, as in they, they, get, they harden up and shrink down. Um, you're not able to produce uh, a lot of the enzymes you need to break down foods, um, and you don't absorb things very well. So you're malnourished, and um, your lungs are screwed. Despite advances in treatment, half of today's sufferers won't survive beyond their 38th birthday. Patient Chris is 20 years old. What's it like being like a young person in and out of hospital so much? Um, it didn't use to bother us at all. <clears throat> uh, when I first started coming in every two weeks, but when you start to come in like more often, oh, I was in Christmas, my birthday. It's like my chest can't cope without IVs. Right. So as soon as they were off, I start to develop a cough during the night. Then my appetite goes, and then just end up back in. Mm. It's like my sun and season ticket. Yeah, yeah. And I said I can't buy one now. Because not... I don't know when I'm going to be in here. Yeah. Are you in hospital more than you are out of hospital at the moment, or what? That's about uh, 26 out of 50. Uh, weeks really? Of, uh, That's a lot of weeks in hospital. Cystic fibrosis sufferers are often in and out of hospital, and they see a lot of junior doctors come and go. Next, Adam is seeing 28-year-old Laura. So, uh, how's it going? Should we see if we can find some blood from you somewhere? Hey. Was that, is that, is that blood coming out? Oh yeah, it's blood coming out. <laughs> Adam seems to be making a good impression. Quite hilarious. Brightens your day, actually. <laughs> you get some that are just not very, I don't know, kind of moody and stroppy teenagers. Because they're all a lot younger these days, aren't they? Scrubs up well, as I would say. <laughs> you know, it's got to be hard for them. And, you know, I, I try and empathise as much as I can, but it's limited. Cystic fibrosis patients bring the junior doctors face to face with the limitations of medicine. Lucy's finding out if she can cope with this at work as she's treating other seriously ill patients on the gastro ward. 
It's the start of the shift, and she's with consultant Dr. Gunn on the ward round. Okay, consultant runs the consultation with the patient, and junior doctor runs around with a pen and scribbles in the notes and orders blood tests and writes on the jobs list all the things that they need to be done. Usual notes, hunters going on. They're allegedly in here, but they're not actually in here. Short history of diarrhea. The scent stool's off, presumably, and yeah. she's doing okay, better. Okay, that's fine. Nice. The ward round is also a chance for juniors like Lucy to shadow senior doctors as part of their ongoing training. Dr Gunn's really good, she does teaching and things if she can on the ward round as well. Should be quite a good learning experience. Dr Gunn's particularly concerned about one patient. She has been admitted with a swollen tummy. Pretty well, that's great. And you've been unwell on this occasion for how long now? Okay. And what is it you've been noticing? Okay. Vomit. Okay. Your tummy then, when did that start to swell up? Okay. How are you with walking around? <laughs> the patient has had a number of tests to determine the problem. Her x-ray is back. As part of her training, Dr Gunn asks Lucy to assess it. Bowel wise, it looks like some gaseous dilatation here on the left hand side. But here there's this, this sort of central dilated small bowel, and that we know she's obstructing radiologically, and it sounds like clinically because she's acutely distended. So she's in trouble mm -hmm. in that she has now got a fairly rapid change in her clinical state mm -hmm. over the last six weeks mm -hmm. and now got small bowel obstruction. But she's not got curative disease, mm -hmm. okay, so we can't take this out of an operation. Mm -hmm. Chemotherapy is not particularly good. I don't think she's going to be fit enough for her anyway. No. I need to assess her clinically, but I have to say my gut feeling is we should be fairly conservative, because mm -hmm. I think this is only going to get worse. Mm -hmm. There isn't an operation that's going to help with this, mm -hmm. be that palliative or otherwise. Mm. Dr Gunn makes the final diagnosis. It's pancreatic cancer. In this case, an operation won't help, and the condition is terminal. Although she's poorly, she's got this sort of bright, bright-eyed happiness about her in a funny kind of way. Like she's here and she's being sorted and I really don't, I, I don't know, I could be completely misreading it. I just seriously get the feeling she's not going to have any idea of what's about to be said. Dr Gunn must break the news and Lucy accompanies her. Today has been told some of the worst news, well, the worst news that she's ever going to hear, ever. Her life has literally been taken away from her like that. And she's just been told, right, you're going to go home to die. So, yeah. Anyway. Is there anything else you want me to do for her today? Is it all sorted? Okay. You're right. Yeah. Sure. Oh, it's sad, isn't it? She's, um, she's got good family support, which helps a lot. And she will we'll get her feeling better, which is important thing there is quality of life, which we can definitely improve. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's hard, one of the difficulties, of course. It's all right, it's not going to go, so I'll just get away from me. That's all right, and I won't be nice without you. <laughs> all right. Thank, Thank you. you. But well, that's yeah, it for today. Yeah. Morning. Okay, no problem. It's all right. <laughs> oh. There's a lot of patients you can't save, if that's the word you use. Um, you can improve on patients, and that's what a lot of the goal is for the patient, making them better, not necessarily curing them, making them better. But there are specific challenges, such as the patients who have um, advanced cancer who come in and die, and I think that's very hard, and I still find that very hard. After a 13-hour shift, Lucy's finally back at home with the other junior doctors. Are you okay? <sighs> just knackered and had a shit day. <coughs> Why was it a shit day? Oh, it's just this awful case. The patient who's basically been told today that she's got pancreatic cancer. I don't know, I thought, you know, I'd be able to keep my cool and I didn't really very well. But luckily I was in the doctor's office at that point, no one really... that's when it hits you. Yeah. It just left me completely drained. I sort of sat there and I was just like... So, but anyway, that was my day. Do you so, need a hug? Maybe. <laughs> Thanks, it's the first time I've ever been involved in any kind of breaking bad news and to be honest I don't think it could have been worse bad news to be break breaking to somebody and their family. I'm definitely learning at the moment that there is a limit to what we can do as medics. We are only human and in some ways in medicine if we could all turn into the superhero then that would be great because in this, not in the sense of 
ego, I mean, in terms of actually being able to save people and cure everybody. I mean, it would, would be amazing, but in all reality, that's never going to happen. And obviously, that's what we'd love to see. All the junior doctors know that tomorrow, it could be them facing the same situation. Susie has been assigned to accidents and emergency, where every shift she has to deal with critical cases. Are you happy to shock? I haven't shocked anyone. I've been at arrest calls before, but never in an A and E situation. So, can you squeeze my fingers, please? Squeeze them. It's one of the doctors here. How are you feeling? Now back in A&E, she's facing another major trauma incident. A man has attempted suicide by jumping into the River Tyne. He was saved from drowning, but after 30 minutes in the river, his core body temperature has dropped, and he's at risk of severe hypothermia. This gentleman's come in. He was in the River Tyne for about half an hour, so we need to try and get him warmed up, really. Sharp scratch coming now, sharp scratch. An estimated 30,000 people die from exposure to the cold every year in the UK. Susie attempts to bring his temperature back up slowly by pumping warm fluid into his bloodstream. Have you had a drink then this evening? That's all I've had. Finally, with his temperature stable, Susie can check for other injuries. Ah, uh, okay. All right. I wanted to tell you this afternoon, the Is, is that normally sore for you? It is sore normally. <laughs> Can I ask you to take a big deep breath for me? And out. <laughs> Something that was in his chest. Doesn't sound clear anyway. Give him a chest x-ray. It's Saturday night. And I was probably out having a drink. But I'm here. Don't help me, so it's fine. What, sorry? No drink. No drink, I know. He's stable and out of immediate danger. Susie and the team have done all they can, but he'll have to be referred on to another department for further treatment. Also working nights for the first time is Susie's housemate, 24-year-old Catherine. She's a first year, on call, and part of a team covering up to 280 surgical patients. With only a couple of weeks' experience as a fully-fledged doctor, her skills are being severely tested. And when the pain comes on, do you get any other symptoms? Hello again, Joyce. God seems to be able to order any blood on any of the computers. Um, no one else seems to be having any problems. In her first few weeks, Cambridge graduate Catherine found the workload tough. I've just got so much stuff to do. I've already got patients been waiting for an hour and a half now. So I've got this out for now. Um, and I'll come back and do that when I've... Yeah, I've got quite a lot of jobs to do, so... Right. Let's just stop then, okay? I don't think I really appreciated how difficult it is when you're just literally just being bombarded with jobs to do and everything has to be done within the next sort of ten minutes. But now Catherine is working nights, a job which brings its own particular challenges. Um, it's been pretty busy. Haven't really had a break yet. Yeah, I'm pretty tired. But not any more tired than I would be on a day shift. Have, if I've not had a break until this time anyway, so it's not too bad. I've been working about, I don't know how many hours, since half eight this evening, last, yesterday evening. Um, I'm getting quite tired. <laughs> Another patient has arrived and needs a small tube called a cannula inserted into a vein to allow them to get fluid and medication directly into the patient's bloodstream. But this patient doesn't like the sight of her own blood. And so much vein to go for. I don't want to put, put the needle in me. I'll let you know when I'm going to put the needle in so you can look away. Sharp scratch. I just want to make, to make sure they're recovered. Right. So, could you give me a hand? Sorry, this needle's just about to drop out. Blood there. Oh, I think it's coming off. Have you got it now? So, we're nearly done. Oh, gosh, it's now stuck to the pillow. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, the, the little bung popped out on the end of the cannula. We'll just clean it up a bit. The main thing is that it's in. 
can be given you some fluids. Finally, the tube is in, minus a bit of blood, and the patient can get the fluids she needs. It's quite hard to concentrate when you're really tired. Um, you just have to be careful and just be extra cautious and just recognise your limitations, I think. All the juniors are learning just how far they can stretch themselves. John's pushing his limits. He's finished his day job, but he's just getting started on a night shift of his own. At the moment, we're just setting up for the gig. Um, we're going to do a sound check in a minute when our fourth member finally arrives. And um, I shot myself in the face with a simple That's pretty painful. John works hard to fit in a social life. But even away from the hospital, he can't escape the pressures of being a doctor. I'm covering urology nights next week, oh, yeah. and I've never done urology. We had a guy, we had a guy in today, like a young kid, 17, who um, had right testicle pain, swollen for about a week, did a, an ultrasound, he's been dead for like two weeks, they explored it. He's done a high pain threshold now. Yeah. So what's happened to his testicle? It's got removed. In the bin. Medics tend to talk about medicine outside of work, which is really boring. Like, I try my hardest not to, because it's just, I talk about it for 10 hours a day at work, I try not to talk about it in the in our evenings, but I live with medics and I, uh, I play in a band with medics and I play rugby with medics, so you kind of end up kind of reverting to horrible medic chat, but it's all right. All the junior doctors are learning that it's not the kind of job you can leave behind at the end of the day. The pressure of work is always on your mind. After a run of relentless night shifts, Catherine and Susie are taking some time off to hit the shops. A bit of retail therapy is possibly quite good after a stressful it's weekend on call. Really but even shopping can't keep them off the topic of work for long. How do you think everything's going anyway, work and stuff? I think when I first started on call, I just felt completely thrown in the deep end. And it was, it was horrible. I hated my first time call. There are going to be days when you just wish that the ground would swallow you up there, mm. there and then, you know, or when something bad happens or when it's stressful. Mm. And you can't get everything done because you're not Superman. Every day, Susie works long shifts and treats critical cases. The work impacts on all areas of her life. And even though she's making life and death decisions at work, she still needs a bit of help from mum and dad when it comes to tidying her room. Time to tidy. Right, then line up and skip. I'm just wondering why um, I can't find anywhere to walk. I've done. I was up till one o'clock tidying last night. Wash, yeah. wash. What's this here for? <laughs> I was cleaning a surface. You keep telling us that normal life is impossible. Normal life is impossible. Last week I worked five 14-hour shifts and two 12-hour shifts. I then came home, went to sleep, got up, had a shower, ate like some chocolate, and then went back to work again. Mm. Susie has made us proud. You know, that little girl, and we've got pictures of her in all sorts of ridiculous poses, mm -hmm. is now <laughs> responsible and doing things which we can only really imagine. Oops. Can I just get back into bed for the rest of the day? Your room looks like you've spent the last week in bed anyway. It is difficult to see her doing what I know she must be doing, because she's, she's just our daughter. And the mother would like to get into the hospital and just see her working. I would love, I would love to see her working. <laughs> I have no wall. idea what she looks like. And yes, I, I, would love, I would love to be a fly on the wall when she's in the wards. I don't want you to overdo it today. I don't want you to get stressed out. Let's go and crack this egg open. Right, Susie, coffee time. At the hospital, Lucy is back on the gastro ward. It's her first shift since her patient was diagnosed with terminal pancreatic cancer. And Lucy's first thought is to find out how she's doing. On Saturday, she was quite well. She was managing to drink and keep everything down. She wasn't feeling nausea. And on the Sunday when I came in, she just wasn't very well at all. She couldn't get out of bed and her blood pressure dropped and her sats dropped. And then it was all in about two hour period. 
she passed away. Her family were with her though. Really? Oh, good. Yeah. Right. Um, but she didn't suffer for long, and it wasn't playing on her mind and things like that. So. Yeah. That's really sad. Mm -hmm. Hello, this is Lucy F1. Hi there. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. And that was the bereavement office asking me to come and do the best. So that's going to be a nice job. It's another first for Lucy, but one she would rather do without. I don't think it would matter how much talking about it you did. I don't think it would matter how many seminars you had. I don't think it would matter how many times someone told you about it. Um, I don't think it ever really prepares you for when actually it comes to it. part of the job, unfortunately, and it's one side of it that isn't a very nice side, really. Lucy's first few weeks on the gastro ward have been a steep learning curve. Her housemate Catherine also found it tough on her first set of night shifts. But today she's back on days and is feeling much more confident. I've been really enjoying my job this week um, because I don't feel kind of... Yeah, I'm busy, but not to a degree when, where I feel like I'm doing a rubbish job. Also, none of the patients seem to be getting sick this week. Last week, they were all getting sick, which uh, uses up a lot of time. Her next patient, 29-year-old Malcolm, has had minor surgery on his finger. But now he's complaining of chest pains. Well, it's filled pain since yesterday morning, but I think it's just filled work. I think it's just muscle pain. It's quite a problem, I guess, having this, this pain there. Ah, uh, it's just my yeah. heavy mm. lifting. So did it come on suddenly or gradually? Do just gradually. Yeah. Do you smoke at all? Yeah. Can you drink at all? Yeah. How many units would you say a week? I'm not sure. Um, probably about 60 pence a week. 60? Yeah, I don't know what that is. Sorry, 16 16. Mm -hmm. He drinks about 180 units a week, which is way, way, way over what you should be drinking. Catherine is concerned and decides to investigate further. OK, I mean, I, from the history, I, I really, I'm not worried at all about your heart. Yeah. The pain's sort of more round there. Mm -hmm. And say in a typical day, how much would you say you drank? All day session, I was drinking about 16, 18 pints. Okay. Um, do you know if you've ever had any tests done on your liver before? No, I haven't. OK. Just because when I was um, feeling, I thought maybe your liver was slightly enlarged. I mean, I might just ask one of my senior colleagues what they think, because, I mean, it's quite quite a large amount to drink. I want to see this guy. I think that's his... Oh, don't want to say that. Yeah. This guy, yeah. He's only 29, 30. He's taking facial history, and he drinks 60 pints a week. Um, and I think he's got a bit of an enlarged liver. 60 pints a week is something, 120-something oh, units. Oh, right. yeah. I thought it was the sort of thing I didn't feel I could go home at the end of the day having not done nothing about. So um, it was really good to talk to Ian to, to talk me through what I should do about it and reassure me that I was right to think that it should be fine. But, um, if you pop back to the day room and, as I said, it doesn't really... Catherine happen. sends the patient for further tests on his liver. <laughs> A successful diagnosis is a boost to confidence, but a few weeks in, Catherine is still finding her feet. I think it's been a while still before I settle in. I don't feel massively confident about my organisational skills yet, my time management skills. I still need to work on a lot. I mean, I think I'm getting, I think I'm getting better, slowly. Fellow junior doctor Adam is also still finding his way. He's getting to know some of the regular patients on the respiratory ward and he's realising the limits to the care he can give them. Are you, are you comfortable there, sir? 81-year-old <laughs> John is suffering from advanced chronic lung disease. You sure? OK. I mean, you, look, you, look, you look a little skew I mean, I... I'm sorry, hold on, can you... Oh, it I just want to push him up there, get it in the side. Yep, there you go. That'll do. Yeah. He's not really too well. He's, he's on oxygen and... Um, He's quite sort of got quite advanced lung disease, and he had had a heart attack over the weekend as well. Which didn't didn't help matters. He's a really nice guy though, so I hope he does pull through it. But you know, I think the reality of the matter is he's probably only got a short amount of time to live, and he knows that. Adam can't cure him. He can just help make him feel more comfortable. 
What I'm going to do is write you up for that spray that makes the blood vessels wider. So if you do get any pain, please tell the nurses. Yes, I'm going to take many blood. Well, I am going to take a little bit. <laughs> you like taking blood off me. <laughs> you know they call me a vampire on a day. Yeah. I can't believe I've got such a bad reputation. You're a funny fella, man. I'm doing all you. He's a nice fella. They're all, they're all nice people. Can I do enough for you now? This is what smoking does for you. That's smoking related. So being a trucker for nearly 50 years, you just smoke one after the other. You know? If you do get any pain in the chest, let one of the nurses know, okay? Don't just sit on it. If we can do something about it, we can do something about it. Okay, oh, yes, sir. All right? Okay. What no more blood? Blood bank's full now. Until tomorrow. <laughs> All right, see you in a Adam has spent five years learning how to save lives, but he can't cure John. It's difficult when you start to sort of have formulations with people on the ward, um, when you know that, you know, realistically, they are relatively terminal. Um, really pisses me off. He has to sit there and endure a quality of life that he doesn't enjoy. It just really pisses me off. You know, if that was me, and my quality of life was like that, and I didn't have any choice in the matter, and I actually kept going. I'd be really fucking pissed off. The new doctors are all facing the limits to modern medicine, and of their own abilities to help patients. Like I had a, a patient that I sent home last week who came back in via resource, and obviously when I heard that I was like, crap, like, could I have done anything earlier or, you know, but when I saw her, she was absolutely fine. Her tummy was soft, her arms were fine. There was no indication that anything bad was going to happen. You always think, like, well, would anyone else have kept her there or should I have done something else? But then I spoke to the consultant and he said, well, you aren't able to see in the future. Like, there's no way of knowing if someone's fine that they're going to get sick, you know? I mean, it'd be a really easy job then, you know, but... It's not, and there's, there's always going to be good days and bad days, and some of the bad days are like the worst days ever. There is a huge problem, and one that can't be avoided, of people expecting us to be perfect. But we're only human, you know? Like, we're, we're just like everyone else. The only difference is that we've been to medical school and we've been trained. That, that's the only difference. OK, if you could have one superhero power that wasn't the power of healing to help you as a doctor, <laughs> what would it be? I'd like to be able to see into the future and know who was going to get sick and treat them just as right as they got sick and just treat them and th then they'd be fine again. But that's probably not going to happen, which is why it's hard to be a doctor. I would like the ability to know where anything was just by thinking about it. Or just it's be able a very to summon it to your hand. No, it's a, oh, it's a very simple thing, <laughs> knowing where everything is in every IV room or in every crash trolley, every or yeah. simply where the gallstone is or where the tumour is, you know. But just that ability would actually cut out an awful lot of wasted time. I would want something like um, x-ray vision with telekinesis. I can just see the tumour and actually fix it without actually opening up the patient. Mm. See that, that all yours are really interesting because what I'd have is I'd, I'd have I'd have this like unstable DNA that could take all your powers and I could just absorb all of them, <laughs> all of them together and then I'd be like a super superhero and it would be amazing. One housemate, John, is still at work. He may not have any superpowers, but in an emergency, he can be a patient's best chance of survival. It's not long before he has another emergency on his hands. The crash alarm has gone off again. Another patient needs urgent assistance. Level two rehabs place. I don't know where that is. <coughs> Cardiac arrest. <coughs> Gotta find the place first. I have to see what, what happens when we get there. The quicker he can get to the patient, the greater the chance of survival. So I've just got to find out where, where this crash was. Like the other cardiac arrest he was called to, it's a life and death situation. But the odds are stacked against John and the team. Cardiac arrest. To the left or right? Which way? More than 90% of cardiac arrest victims die. Can we go to the bed? So let's put his head. I've got his head. On three, one, two, three. The patient's heart rate is crashing. The team must stabilise his heart's rhythm, or else the man will go into full heart failure. 
I see you're gonna feel shut up scratching your arm. Well done. Right, I've got just keep the stump still for me, I know it's a bit sore. If you roll me for a couple of bits of that, just not very long. Yeah. Right, uh, fluid. Fluid over here. Find fluids there. Yeah. You've got an orange in. You're doing well, sir, you're doing well. Finally, they get his heart rate back to normal. So that was just um, a cardiac arrest call. His signs were looking bad, so he was, his heart rate was low and his blood pressure had dropped and he, he looked like he might have a cardiac arrest. So then we basically preempted it. Um, it. Turns out by the time we got there, we just did simple things. Put in some lines in the arms, put up some fluid, come on a monitor. He wasn't in too bad a shape. Back to the ward and the end of another long shift. See you later, guys. When you go to a rest call, everyone else has different roles, whether it's sort of... Oh, there's a lady over there on the floor. <laughs> but a junior doctor's work is never done. A patient has collapsed in the corridor. Hello. John checks for vital signs. She's got out of it. Her heart's still beating and she's breathing. What's the matter? Is it shortness of breath or? Hello, what happened? Hello, lovely. You ready? One, two, two three. three. To find out the cause of the collapse, she'll need further tests back on the ward. Wow. <laughs> Exciting. And John can finally head home. Bye. It's the end of the month. After four weeks of learning the ropes and facing the limits of their abilities, juniors across the country have been paid their first ever wage packets. Except one. Please be paid, please be paid. The only one who hasn't received a pay slip. I think that I gave them the wrong... the wrong <laughs> national insurance number. Yes, I got paid! 99 pounds in credit. Sweet! The basic wage for a junior doctor is about 22 and a half thousand pounds. And they're all splashing their new hard-earned cash at the traditional payday party. You can work for a month without having been struck off. That is an achievement. And every month, every month, that's what I think to myself. I have not yet been struck off. Here's to a good job well done. Next time, is Susie cut out for the highs and lows of A&E? With the pain, you know, being distressed. Is Kia cut out to be a surgeon? Patient's looking a little jaundiced for my liking. And after all their training, is medicine really the career for them? Basically, days like today just make me